Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak here. Let me see whether technology is a limiting factor in this uh, respect. I'm afraid it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, back, back, please. Oh, well, that, that's my fault. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, just to very briefly introduce myself and the organization I, I represent today, uh, um, Dings and I represent T&E, Transport and Environment. We are a federation of uh, 51 environmental NGOs that campaign on uh, more sustainable transport, uh, and we are based in, in Brussels, and our objective is to green uh, Europe's uh, transport policy. Um, just to kick off, which which is a kind of the frame, the context that we operate, uh, that we operate in, uh, in today. Um, first of all, it hasn't been said that often today, but uh, um, the climate change science uh, gets scarier almost by the month, I would think. The gap between emissions trends on the one hand, which are really accelerating, and the knowledge and what we need to achieve uh, by 2020, 30, 50 is widening uh, by the day, so the urgency is, is, is dramatic. Um, second is transport is uh, very bad at, at uh, reducing emissions. Uh, if transport emissions had been stable, uh, since 1990, uh, Europe would have a very easy job meeting the Kyoto targets. Today, um, it's not a very easy uh, job. Um, th third, some people seem to think that the oil issue will solve itself. All will run out and everything will be beautiful afterwards. Well, uh, we, normal oil certainly runs out, uh, but um, I'm afraid that we are facing a future of dear and dirty oil instead. And the two are linked. If oil is not dear, it doesn't make sense to make oil from tar sands and coal to liquids. So dear and dirty, that's the future for oil. Very problematic. Um, others uh, seem to think if we put transport in the emissions trading system, we'll all be fine. Uh, if you attend meetings on the emissions trading system, we are very much witnessing a situation uh, that uh, going very far in ambitions level in the European emissions trading system uh, will be uh, economically damaging for some sensitive sectors in that system. Uh, the system boundaries, how effective it will be, will essentially be determined by the most sensitive sectors uh, in the system, um, most exposed to, uh, to international competition. And transport, households, buildings uh, are really quite domestic sectors. Uh, there's no way you can replace European transport with Chinese transport, uh, for example. Uh, so there's no carbon leakage issue in transport. There is in other sectors. We should be very careful uh, mixing those. Um, biofuels, uh, another potentially easy way out. Many doubts have arisen, particularly over the carbon impacts of indirect land use, uh, which threaten to change biofuels into usually a good idea, into usually a bad idea. Um, uh, the, the carbon impact of indirect land use, and electricity and hydrogen uh, are still far away. So that's uh, a, a quite a bleak picture, particularly for the future of hydrocarbons, I would say. There's really not a great prospect for sustainable hydrocarbons uh, over the next decade. This uh, reinforces the point that we believe that integration of transport and ETS might seem uh, an, a nice way forward, but we, we believe it's a bad idea. Uh, for the environment, it doesn't matter where you cut CO2. Uh, for the economy, it matters a great deal whether you cut CO2 in strongly exposed sectors, uh, exposed to international competition, or that you do it in more domestic sectors like transport, like households, like buildings. Uh, economically, it's much more damaging uh, to be tough on carbon in exposed sectors than it is in domestic sectors. And before we uh, consider the idea of integrating transport in a system for exposed sectors, we really need to think twice, three, four, five times. Um, very short words on biofuels as well. There's a very odd situation now going on in European uh, policy. There's two strongly competing policy ideas. One idea is the old-fashioned idea of fixing a quantity target for biofuels, uh, saying by 2020, 10% of energy supplied in transport needs to, be, needs to be biofuels. Now, that tells the market, supply as many liters as, of biofuel as possible at the lowest, cost, uh, lowest possible cost. Uh, and inevitably, that leads to friction with sustainability. We're trying to solve that through regulation. And 
frankly, uh, what's coming out now is, is quite a mess. So we need to shift towards a more modern approach. Uh, fortunately, uh, two uh, important regions in the world are shifting to that more modern approach. One of them is Europe. Uh, Europe proposed a low carbon fuel standard a bit more than a year ago, which says uh, it doesn't matter which technology you use, uh, as long as you cut life cycle carbon from your fuels, you're fine. Set the life cycle carbon for greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and the best biofuels will prevail, and last but not least, you send a strong signal that non-conventional oil, petrol and diesel, is not welcome in Europe, and California is doing exactly the same. We believe that's the way forward. Technology neutrality, uh, carbon-based fuel policy. Um, a couple of general words on, uh, on car efficiency standards. We believe, contrary to what some economists think, that they are a very efficient uh, policy tool. The discount rate of consumers is very high. That means they do not consider future fuel savings uh, very much in their purchase decision. It's a very good reason for policy intervention. It's possibly very effective. We are certainly talking about double digits uh, of emission reduction. Other measures are very difficult to achieve uh, such percentages with other, uh, other measures. One often overlooked issue is that car efficiency standards are very fair. The benefits end up uh, primarily at consumers who are not able uh, or capable to buy a new car. They don't, do not pay much for the technology, they get the fuel saving benefits. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's a measure to help citizens rather than to make them pay uh, the bill for uh, climate policy. They are competition neutral, uh, and don't have negative side effects and they create lots of added value in the supply chain. Um, there's more of a value added in, in cars. Um, one issue that we should certainly consider as well, if, if we sell a car today, you basically sign a check of 130 barrels of oil imports over its lifetime. At today's oil prices, that comes down to 11,000 euros of uh, uh, money that just flows outside of the European economy without any, any tangible uh, benefit. Uh, the economics of improving cars are uh, very, very good with oil prices that we see uh, today. Um, and one issue that is never considered in any impact assessment is that um, if we cut oil use by making our cars better, we can get a grip on oil prices. History has shown that uh, in the 80s, when global oil demand dropped, uh, oil prices dropped very, very sharply, and we were basically having 20 years of cheap oil as a result of those cuts in the 80s. Uh, I think we are, we are on the eve of another cycle like this, that we are going to, I hope we will seriously cut oil demand and uh, that we will get the prices back in the bottle. Begging OPEC to pump more oil is not a constructive answer to today's crisis. We think uh, cutting uh, own oil use is, is slightly more constructive. Uh, then the question, what's technically feasible? Um, many assessments all, only look at technology, what technology can do, low carbon technology, that's all fine, that's all reasonable, but we believe in order to achieve the drastic carbon cuts uh, that we need, we cannot just look at low carbon technology, we also need to look at low carbon car specification, so really changing uh, you know, car designs. And these are just a couple of examples how far that can potentially take you. The world record in CO2 emissions is currently 0.8 grams of CO2. I'm not suggesting this car is marketable tomorrow, but it just shows you that you can think in different orders of magnitude if you're prepared to change the way you think about cars. Uh, but it does imply a huge paradigm shift. Uh, we need to think different about car size. We definitely need to think different about car weight. Um, performance is probably the most important paradigm shift that needs to take place. Uh, cars are currently sold often on the basis of power. They need to be sold on the basis of economy. Fuel economy needs to be an asset. And uh, that will not be easy for an industry that has thrived on the slogan, there's no substitute for cubic inches. Uh, there is a substitute for cubic inches, and admitting <laughs> that uh, you have been wrong for 100 years is not easy, but it needs to, uh, it needs to happen, uh, I believe. Um, then uh, a few words about compliance costs. They have been discussed a lot. Uh, although I'm a me mechanical engineer myself, I wouldn't claim to hold the truth uh, in, the, in this matter. But as an observer of uh, what happens and an, uh, as an observer of uh, research in this field, uh, what you see is that ex-post 
cost realizations in the market are much better than ex-ante estimates as a rule. And the literature points to that uh, after regulation has been introduced, the real costs are two to ten times lower than was estimated before. And then the, the obvious question is, now why is that? There's two reasons, I think, technical reasons. Uh, the car industry has thousands of very, very clever engineers who are together a lot more cleverer than uh, usually two or three consultants who draw up uh, a nice report. They are also clever, but they are just you know, less numerous. So it's inevitable that engineers, thousands of car engineers, have more clever ideas. Secondly, uh, there's a strategic reason behind this. Uh, before introduction of a regulation, all the incentives for the industry are to pump up the cost figures. And what you essentially see, Paul Niebenhuis can attest to that, is that it's very difficult, for example, to get cost figures from suppliers. Uh, they tend to be very, very cautious about communicating what they have got and what it will cost. The only people that will tell you what things will cost are OEMs, and they, of course, have a, an interest in increasing the cost figures until the regulation is in place, then the incentive is to cut them. So these are some observations on, on cost. Then on the European proposal, um, we think it's a very flexible proposal. We don't have a lot of... Uh, problems with that, um, it, but it is, it is a very flexible proposal. Fleet averaging, you can even pool with other car makers. It's attribute based, giving more room for uh, bigger cars. But we do have a problem with the lack of ambition. We need to realize that 130 by 2012 is only 7% less than 140 by 2008 and four years later. Uh, and 140 by 2008 is what the industry promised to achieve by itself. Uh, I would like to say a few words as well on the fact that the regulation is weight-based uh, because we believe that is a very bad idea. If you see this graph where the energy of a car goes to, weight plays a very important role. Um, cutting, weight, cutting weight is therefore very, very critical. Uh, and uh, what the EU regulation will in fact do is punish car makers who cut weight of their cars. Uh, if you um, uh, if you make cars in 2012 with an average weight of 1,214 kilos, this is quite an arbitrary figure, then your company standard uh, uh, will be um, 120, 27 grams. If you cut that down by 100 kilos, your company standard will become 122 grams. So you get almost 5 grams penalty for doing the right thing. Um, and if your competitors do the the wrong thing, your own target gets even tougher. So it's completely counterproductive and it really is a discouragement for cars of 400 kilos, for example, that we saw as concept cars uh, today. Um, also, a lot of talk today about diesel, that we need to cut down on diesel. If we have weight-based standards, diesel cars are heavier and they get weight-based standards give diesel cars an extra credit because they are heavier. A very unwelcome development. Uh, this is how the U.S. does it. This is an area where Europe can learn from the U.S. Footprint-based standards uh, and not a straight line, uh, uh, quite a smart curve that avoids all too drastic outcomes for very small cars and very uh, large cars. I think this is a very balanced approach uh, for future, future EU regulation. So, summary, the easy way out. ETS and biofuel are really not easy and they are not even a way out, we believe. Um, if you think that making cars better is difficult, then you know, look at the alternatives. We think they are even more difficult. Uh, the benefits of car regulation are, as a rule, underestimated and the costs are overestimated. I think that's a nice one for, for debate. And uh, uh, basing, standards or, or basing car standards on the car's weight is a big, big mistake that really discourages car makers from doing the right thing. Thank you very much.